If you were to read the standard histories of the Irish War of Independence, you'll find something missing, and that's discussion of what actually went on in the north of Ireland, in Ulster. There's a very good reason for this. There wasn't much action. The IRA wasn't very active in most parts of Northern Ireland. If you look at the standard picture we have of the War of Independence, it's Michael Collins's flying units um, attacking British state forces. And there was remarkably little of that in Northern Ireland. Ulster was a place apart. The reason for this is not difficult to ascertain. It would be foolish to say that the rest of Ireland was homogenous. Cities like Dublin and Cork had Protestant minorities, but they were relatively small. Ulster had a very clear Protestant majority. And for the IRA to operate in the north was far more difficult. You were surrounded by Protestant neighbours who were intensely hostile to nationalism in all its forms, whether it was Home Rule nationalism, Sinn Féin or the IRA. One of the most impressive thing things from a Protestant point of view is the fact that they actually kept together. There are isolated individuals who went over to the other side, but they are individuals. The result of this was that the war in the sense that we know it in the South really didn't happen in the North. There are um, a few areas where there was some activity. South Armagh, just about the most Catholic area of, of Northern Ireland, there was activity there and in parts of Derry, but these were exceptions. This is not to say that Ulster was uh, a peaceful place between 1919 and 1921. There was communal violence on a scale that was totally different to the rest of Ireland. The nearest thing we really got to communal violence in the rest of Ireland were individual attacks on Protestant farmers. And remember, the, the ownership of farms was disproportionately in the hands of Protestants, particularly large farms during this period. It remained so. And so a farmer or a judge or anyone else who was seen as being a a powerful person would be killed. In Northern Ireland, you had riots. You had communities being attacked, very violent, very bloody, very unpleasant. What is impressive about the, um, the Protestant Unionist position in Northern Ireland is that it crossed classes. During the War of Independence, organised labour in the South was pretty radical. There were strikes, particularly in Dublin and Limerick. There was pressure put on the British state, not just by people with guns, but by workers. In Northern Ireland, the Protestant working class were some of the most unionist groups in Ireland. This was misunderstood by nationalists in the, in, in the South and by British Labour. The idea of actually being desperate to stay British was something which was really not understood. And in one of my favourite um, historical documents, and there is a debate between the Republican socialist James Connolly and the Protestant Unionist William Walker. Both called themselves socialists, but they were very di different kind of socialists. Connolly argued it is in the interest of all labour 
Protestant, Catholic or agnostic for Ireland to separate itself from Britain. William Walker said, no it isn't. We are far, far better off within the United Kingdom. And Walker, until a, a recent um, excellent biography of him, uh, written by a former student of mine, uh, Mike Meacham, has been largely ignore, ignored because he was seen as being somewhat unfashionable. He argued that the British state offered rights to workers which the United Ireland would never be able to. Britain was a progressive state. A 32-county Irish Republic would be dominated by rural Catholic interests. And Walker is a really fascinating character. And what's important about him is he was representative of many people in the Protestant working class in Belfast. One other thing that is interesting about Northern Ireland and explains why the IRA had difficult difficulty being influential there, I think of 1918. In 1918, in much of Ireland, the Irish Parliamentary Party is wiped out. Basically, uh, they had been the dominant party in Ireland ever since people got the vote. But they were almost wiped out. One exception to this is in Belfast, largely due to the influence of one person, Joe Devlin. Devlin was a uh, great organiser who relied on the ancient order of Hibernia and he um, basically um, made, made certain that in 1918 Belfast on, on the nationalist side remained much more an Irish parliamentary party city than a Sinn Féin city. A controversial person in many respects and that might be why he hasn't really received the attention from historians that he, he really ought to. Um, and there's a reason, apart from Devlin himself, why Belfast remained that. It was easy to be a Sinn Féin supporter if you were in County Clare or in County Galway. Being a Sinn Féin supporter in Belfast, you put your life on the line. And many people decided it was too dangerous to declare yourself to be a Republican. Ulster was being radicalised in, in another way as well. The UVF, the Ulster Volunteer Force, was founded. It was a paramilitary organisation totally committed to keeping Ulster within the United Kingdom. It saw itself as an army. But the problem the UVF had then, and actually had in the modern Troubles, was deciding who their enemy were. The IRA did not parade through the streets. And so many of their targets were, were simply Catholics. And they defended this on the grounds that these people were probably Sinn Féin supporters, whether they were or they weren't. Their influence was huge during this conflict. They were at the front line of the, Pro of the Protestants involved in communal, communal violence. Unionist attitudes were hardened by the experience of 1916. Whilst thousands of Protestants died on the Battle of the Somme, they weren't the only ones who died. You talk to some, some Protestants, they, 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 they saw themselves as the only, only victims. No, no. There were so many people who died in that ghastly battle that uh, they weren't just there, and there were, in fact, quite a number of, of, of Catholics who died as well. Nonetheless, one of, one of the regiments was essentially a UVF regiment. The comparison between that act of loyalty and the treachery of those that had taken part in the Easter Rising uh, had a, a major resonance, a major resonance uh, within the Protestant community. When it came to the 1918 general election, there was a real problem on the nationalist side. Britain's um, electoral system, the United Kingdom's electoral system, which survives to this day, is first past the post. 
if in seats with a nationalist majority, both Sinn Féin and the Irish Parliamentary Party stood, the vote would be split, and the result of that is unionists would get in. And so a deal was done. A deal was done and um, nationalist seats were returned to nationalist parties. <coughs> it's, one of the, it's, it's an interesting point. One of the weaknesses of, of, of nationalism both then and in Northern Ireland afterwards was the divide between the two forms of nationalism. And um, I did, did some work some years ago on elections in Ireland between 1920, Northern Ireland between 1920 and uh, the start of the Troubles. And there was three seats in Northern Ireland that had Catholic majorities. And the times when they lost these seats was when you had a Republican standing against some kind of um, Irish Parliamentary Party or equivalent. Um, and ele electoral deals were necessary if you were going to get a nationalist returned. In 1918, although they didn't do as well in, in Northern Ireland as elsewhere, it was a, a massive victory for Sinn Féin. The conflict continued through to 1920. And as I said, in Northern Ireland, in, in, in Ulster, Northern Ireland, call it what you want, it was mainly communal violence. Between 1920 and the end of 1921, 557 people were killed. Very importantly, the vast majority of these people died because of their religion. They weren't competents. It was a conflict fueled by sectarianism. 557 killed, and the majority of them, 303, were Catholics. And it was, as one historian once said, you became a target because you lived on a Catholic street or a Protestant seat, street, uh, it, was, um, it, it was a particularly rep repulsive form of violence. 172 Protestants also died. And 82 members of the security forces. Catholics were disproportionately represented in death statistics. As, as well as the deaths, there was an attempt by Protestants to drive Catholics out of areas. If you were living in a mixed area, you were not made welcome. It's exactly the same happened after 1969. According to one measurement, around 10,000 Catholics were driven out of their homes between 1919 and 1921 and it didn't stop there. Catholic businesses were targeted. Although the IRA campaign was relatively minor in Ulster, the stories from down south reached Northern Ireland. Unionist politicians would use stories of what they saw as terror against Protestants in Ireland as evidence that this would happen to the Protestant community in Northern Ireland if they weren't vigilant. The British Army, which had not been deployed in large numbers during the conflict, well, from April 1920, the, the numbers increased by 1,500. In Ju July 1920, the assassination of the police commissioner, G.B. Smith, in Cork was to prove symbolically a very important event. Southern rail, rail workers refused to transport his body from Cork to Belfast. This caused extreme anger in union circles. One result of this was the expulsion of Catholic workers from Harland and Wolfe by an organisation called the Protestant Association. Harland and Wolfe is a, a thing of the past now I can remember visiting it in the 1970s and by that stage it was still the case that of skilled jobs 99% were Protestant. If 
you applied to do a skill job, a skill job was one that would have probably resulted or was to result in an apprenticeship, and you came from the Falls Road, you wouldn't get it. In response to this, there was an organisation organised by, amongst others, Sean McEntee, a prominent Sinn Féin uh, supporter, and various members of the Irish clergy, called the Boycott Belfast Campaign. Had absolutely nothing to do with Belfast. Um, the contradiction in this was that there were still many Catholics living in, in Belfast, and they suffered quite a lot from the... the, the, the not the ending of, of, of economic activity between the South and the North, but certainly it, it became far rarer. The formation of the Ulster Special Constabulary was significant. This was a quasi-paramilitary organisation, which was now part of the state. The UVF joined it in huge numbers. It didn't ban Catholics, but in practical terms, what became known as the B Specials was a Protestant organisation. It was to continue until the late 1960s. Its influence was exaggerated in many respects, but symbolically it showed that there was a Protestant force which would defend the Protestant community, which would defend Northern Ireland. And it was feared, and I, I can remember in the early 1970s talking about the B specials and people would get very, very, very upset, very emotional on the Catholic side because these were seen as the enemy. The Government of Ireland in 1920 partitioned Ireland, very, very important partition in that the whole of Ulster did not go, go, go in. Th three counties, Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal, remained within the Irish Free State. And there was a good reason for this. Although if there was a sectarian headcount, the majority of people in Ulster would have wanted to remain, were Protestant and would have wanted to remain within the United Kingdom. It was a very slim majority. And given that Catholics had more children than Protestants, it's a majority that could easily disappear. And so it became a six-county state with a two-to-one majority of Protestant Unionists. In the election in May 1921, the Unionists established a very clear majority, a majority that was to continue for the duration of the Northern Irish Parliament until it was prorogued in, in 1972. It is difficult to imagine when one looks at this period to see an outcome which could have been worse for nationalist Ireland. They didn't achieve a republic even in the 26 counties. They'd lost six counties. It was abundantly clear that the British state was not going to move on Ulster. The injustice of that in the eyes of nationalists in Ireland was no argument with the British state. As far as they were concerned, the words of the, the late great historian AJP Taylor that Britain solves the Irish question in 1921, well, in the eyes of the British states, they had. As we know, 50 years later, the Irish question re-emerges. But the biggest weakness, if one looks at the Irish War of Independence in Ulster, is that the war really didn't happen there. And communal violence was ugly and horrible, but really didn't push the British state into a corner. When one looks at Ulster, I go back to the term I used at the beginning, a place apart. For unionists, this was a, uh, this was a massive victory. Most of them, never wanted a parliament in Belfast. They wanted to remain within the United Kingdom. But in time, they became um, very, very satisfied that they had their own parliament. And when it was ended in 1972, they were very sorry to lose it.
Northern Ireland was different. Its demographics made that certain. And one of the points about this period is it's very, very difficult when one looks at the beginning of it not to conclude that to some, some extent, given the ideologies of the various players, that partitioned Ireland became inevitable. Thank you very much.